Are you hope you're fine? This is the shiny show. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Good luck, Stevia. Oh, it's the Shy Life Podcast. Oh, there's going to be some drama ahead. All I wanted was a pie. And then I hatched out of an egg. Okay, bring the mic over. He's ready to record. I see your mental condition is improving. Is it metaphorical? Is it, is it deep? Is it deep? But that boy, he said all that shy is right. Jeez. Blimey, Governor, it's the Shy Life Podcast. Hello, boy. <laughs> Hello. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Shy Life Podcast with me, Paul the Shy Yeti. How you doing? I'm all right. So, uh, what's this episode about? Well, it's about poetry, again. But, uh, well, I did warn you at the start of the year that uh, there was going to be at least four episodes of poetry this year because I released two new books in 2013 that are having their 10th anniversary and two in 2003 that are having their 20th. Well, we've had the two 20th anniversary ones, We've had one of the 10th anniversary ones, and now we're going to be talking about the final book that I released in 2013, Not As Shy As I Was, which was released around the time of my 40th birthday. So I think it's probably time to run the theme music, and then when we come back, I can start telling you all about the poems in this collection. All right, run that theme music. Darling, it's the Shy Life Podcast. <laughs> yes, well, it's a positive thing for the High Life, the Shy Life. Uh, well, I'll go anywhere for potato. Delicious. Hello, campers. How are you? You quite like a big bang, don't you? Good gracious. Well, that's a whopper. Oh, look at Go Shy Yeti. Oh, my God, he hasn't found out my secret. Maybe he has. I love the Yeti test, it's my favourite thing. If you thought that was bad, just listen to this. Yeah, I, I'm strangely drawn to Yeti and the girl's ankles as well. <laughs> I could eat more body weight in crisps <laughs> every day. Has anyone seen my hot sausage? It's all gooey and juicy. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> Here comes the gravy. It's the Shy Life Podcast. I can't wait for it to begin. <laughs> I'd like that. Yeah. Look, mommy, I'm famous. <laughs> Marvellous. Marvellous, Paul. Hi there. Not As Shy As I Was contains contains over 70 new poems, stories and vignettes by Paul Chandler, Aka Shayeti, written between January and September 2012. They include The Beast of Friends, Drunk Elk, Elephant in the Room, Evil Ivy, Mine Own Minotaur, Once I Lost My Heart to a Cornish Pasty, a Yeti in a Hat, and many more. I had to double-check that, listeners, because I was surprised that all these poems are from 2012. Well, pretty much all of them. There's one here I can see from autumn 1996, but that must be a, um, an exception. And there's even one from 2011. But uh, I can't for the life of me remember why it took such a long time for this, uh, this book to come out, other than that it had taken um, an age for the previous book to come out. So perhaps that delayed this one too. I also can't remember why it was another three years before my next poetry book after this one, or what I was working on in 2013, um, considering that these poems were written in 2012. But uh, I, I, I know I was doing I know I know was doing my poetry videos, although I kind of stopped doing those in 2013. I know I wasn't very well uh, in 2013, but I don't know. I don't know. I did two more, well, I did two more books, The Yeti Way of Thinking um, and Pieces of Shy Yeti, uh, after this, um, I'm trying to think which one of those pieces of Shy Yeti was stuff from the blog, I think. So I can understand why that took me a while to finish. But, um, yeah, but the Yeti way of thinking, um, yeah, I, I, I guess maybe I was slowing down. Um, I was also working on script books, but, yeah, I should, I should be able to remember what I was up to, but, uh, Obviously, uh, Yeti Way of Thinking, um, the show I did for Yeti Way of Thinking, 
which was my last show at the Poetry Cafe to date, was one of the very early episodes of the Charlotte podcast in the summer of 2016. Um, I'm glad that uh, I, I was able to include that as a podcast. Um, I don't know if I took any video of that one, but I certainly have the audio. Um, but uh, I was going to say it's quite a chunky book, but this is the hardback edition I'm looking at. It's 288 pages. I guess that is quite chunky, but um, I think it probably feels chunkier because the paper's quite thick. It's quite nice, quite good paper. Um, so it says, The contents within were written between January and September 2012. The draft version was finished in spring-summer 2013, um this version this is the first version that was released um it was released in december 2013 which is slightly after um my uh, my birthday it may be that i think i definitely did a show um i did even yet he turned 40 friday 29th of november 2013 that was to celebrate this book um at one point, I was going to have um, the title, Not As Shy As I Was, as the title of one of my compilations, but uh, instead, because I'd already done Shy Yeti Rules OK, and I uh, decided to make the sequel to that, Shy Yeti Still Rules OK. Uh, that was partly because I had a T-shirt made around that time um, that said Shy Yeti Rules OK one side, and at the back it said Shy Yeti Still Rules OK, and I decided to use that for the compilation. The... Uh, I say here that originally I had expected Not As Sure As I Was to be my first collection of 2013. However, as Are We There Yet? He was delayed. Not As Shy ended up coming out much later. It was then I decided that it fitted well as my 40th birthday release. Not As Sure As I Was was also the 20th original collection that I'd published since 2001. And I must have been performing poems from this quite a while before the book was put together. So... As usual, I'll probably be reading mainly the uh, poems. The, the, uh, I believe there are stories and prose pieces. We might read some of the shorter prose pieces. I did commission some artwork for this book, although there are plenty of photos as well. Um, I think some of those were from sort of 2012, 2013, as the book was coming together. So the contents of Not As Shy As I Was are as follows. Another Yeti poem, Auntie Astrid goes to Germany. At the strike of midnight, autumn's coming, the ballad of dead-eyed Bob, the beast of friends, a poem, be sotted, the bridge, British summertime is here, come for tea, coming unravelled, cracking the crackless egg, dancing keeps you young, difficult second album, a doll's life, drunk elk, an elephant in the room, evil ivy, the fallout shelter, for all to see, from where I stand, glamour at all times, goth stay off, hello, hello, I'm Halloween, a huge decision, I am sick, but do I want to be cured, I'm a jellyfish, I cleaned out my dirty mind, if I can't have a bulldog, I lost my heart to a cornish pasty, uh, which is the lyrics to a song, I think I used to be a dog, it was me, Jack Frost chilli diet, Jim? A job at the council, the leak, a little company, loves a good curry, the man eater of Surrey Green, mandatory training, the melting snowman, mine own minotaur, that's also a song, or lyrics to a song, Mr. Mosquito, missed you, more is not always more, my baggage and the beast, national treasure, a nice hot bath, not as shy as I was, on the edge, patience is the key. Queen of the Christmas season, Samson's unruly streak, shaving werewolves, she's our boss, something's up with Rocky Lobster, sprightly and statuesque, a tart in Prude's clothing, the truth about cake, a unicorn at breakfast, vision, a wake-up call, the walking sequin, the wedding breakfast, we're all just brains, what lies within, when today's modern artists are no longer modern, Wigs and Co, the world's best worstest dancer, the world is full of bullies, a yeti in a hat, a young head on old shoulders, your cake-addled mind, 
and Zombie Flicks are the new rom-com. I had uh, illustrations by um, three different, well, no, four different uh, artists in this book. Photos um, I took pretty much all of them, but there was artwork by Adam M. Botsford, who was somebody I met online. Uh, Pete Katsiounis, um, who was a Facebook friend, but also uh, does illustrations. Um, Paul Webster, I used to buy his T-shirts that he did on Redbubble. I think I asked him to do some drawings, which he could then put on T-shirts, which I could then buy. Bear Soup, who is my friend Vinny, who uh, did um, well, he did one of the Yeti drawings, and I used it a lot. That's a border on pages, and I've been using that for years. So before I start reading the poems, I'm, we're going to go to the end. So the poems and the prose, that they go up to about page 136. So that's about half the book. The rest of it is, as had been a tradition, um, it's more about either things, like a di- it's like a di- part diary, part... Um, sort of reprinting my blog so we start off with the birthdays of the writing in not as sure as i was so that's all the dates that the poems were written then we get to the fact file so there's a good half page you know for every poem that's in this uh, poem and prose plus photos and of course any poems that i did videos for or appeared at live shows i've recorded all that when i was reading those titles a minute ago i recognized a lot as being poems that uh, I performed at shows. And there are definitely some stories behind these that I'll tell you whether or not I read the actual the actual piece. One of the pictures in this part of the book is even uh, a photo of the, the rough draft I did of one of the poems. So I'm trying to make it a little sort of, I don't know, to show all the different uh, steps of um, this collection. The next part of the book is called Diary of a Shy Yeti. It's really the blog entries that um, I released during the writing of this collection from January to September 2012. So I was blogging about um, Funeral for a Shoe when I first started uh, working on this book. As usual, I uh, keep a tally of the, the views that I got for my videos. Back then in January 2012, my highest viewed video was A Yeti in Winter which is a quite fun video. Then these blog entries, they discuss um, things I've been up to, shows I was doing, videos I was making, Shayeti Rules OK and Shayeti Still Rules OK, uh, because when I did Shayeti Still Rules OK, I refreshed the cover. I had a new Yeti designed. I changed the cover of Shayeti Rules OK to have the Yeti with with the, the logo and uh, so, so that uh, the bo- both collections had the same Yeti on the cover, but with different colourings. I don't think I ever had a full cover designed. I had logos and things that I inserted. My, when I designed my covers, it really was very basic. Uh, I would be working on a, you know, a page of, of a Word document, and I would place the, uh, the drawings on, on the page and then do a PDF of the page, which is why all of my books around this time had had white backgrounds, because I was working on a, a white page. Um, I mean, considering I had no design skills and no... I didn't know what I was doing, really. So I just did what I could. And I was always pretty much happy with my covers. So certainly, considering that when I was at the library, I saw book covers every day. Um, it's amazing how many professionally designed books have very dull covers or... You know, um, one book looks so much like another. Or some books, we used to have, I won't name the publisher, but there was a particular publisher who, if it was a paperback version of the book, it would have a cover. If it was a hardback edition, which cost three or four times more than the paperback, they didn't even bother with a cover. It was just, well, not a pretty cover. All of the books by that publisher were just a blue, a boring blue cover. Uh, It was hardback, but it, it was... Very, I, I mean, it baffled me. I guess they were a captive market. Um, they could, they didn't need to bother with uh, the appearance of the book at all. Uh, while they couldn't have put 
the cover that they used on the paperback as a hardback, I don't know. As you go through the book, there's uh, updated versions of those uh, ratings lists. Um, literally, it is my blog, but in book form, uh, with, with perhaps more photos. And uh, during this period, I did my 200th blog post. I've been blogging since 2001, and I'm still blogging to this day. Although my blogs these days are much more to do with the podcast. In fact, pretty much entirely about the podcast. And I tend to do one one post a month. So I would do about 12 posts a year. Whereas at one stage, there was a lot more. <laughs> because there was nobody to interview me. I used to interview myself about what projects I was working on. And maybe twice a year, I'd do a post about that. So here you've got uh, Tuesday, April the 3rd, 2012. A slightly over 60 second chat with Shayeti. That goes back to how some of the newspapers would do little short interviews with people and they call it like a 60 second interview. So, yeah, my interviews were slightly longer than that. <laughs> but I thought it was a way of sort of letting people know what I was up to in a, in a, in a sort of short, chatty style, really. Um, around the time I'm, that I was putting this book together, I, uh, I went on my honeymoon to... Uh, Dusseldorf. Um, so the, there were things set in Germany in this book. I also have uh, compiled a list here uh, of the 118 blogged poems that are available on the blog at this point. I'd always release a few poems from each collection as the singles from the album, as it were. I always kept my set lists um, for my shows, which I then used to update the... Um, fact files, and I'd even go back and sort of uh, update uh, older editions of, of my other books when I did the 10th anniversaries uh, editions. I was talking about Shaiyaki Still Rules OK. I was talking about um, going on the radio. I was going on Radio Way, uh, which we used to do on the podcast, of course. 2012, um, which this blog sort of um, covers... Uh, was a really busy year what with the videos and the books um, there's stories behind um, some of the poems and even more ratings by July 2012 my highest rated video was a Yeti back in Hollywood part one as I've said before um, some people asked why are there so many pictures of you in this book well, because it was a diary and because doing my poetry became a very visual thing, um, not just a live show, but videos. And I was releasing a lot of videos, and I was going all over the world. Um, uh, I don't want you to think that I'm inferring that I was invited to go all over the world. I just, um, I was just going on holidays or visiting friends in other countries, and I'd always do a video whilst I was away. We only briefly mentioned the fact that I did a couple of albums. Uh, one of them was called Shayeti's Homebrewed Verse. And it included 34 poems um, written between 1992 and 2007. And I, I recorded it back in 2007, but didn't do anything with it. And then eventually I decided it would be nice to release. And then I did another um, album later on. Um, one, day, one day I might even um, record the poems from that album for a podcast. I'll see. You know, I'd probably re-record them rather than just playing the album. But uh, but yeah, so there really is a lot um, filling the back of this book. Another set list for uh, my show, Shayeti Goes Wild, from Wednesday the 5th of September 2012. I don't think uh, the next book was as thick, possibly because I... Uh, I stopped doing the videos and there was a much bigger gap between them. I don't think the fact file was half as detailed for the next book. I really ought to go and look on my blog to see what I got up to in those years in between because it's all rather merged into uh, into one. I also did my autumnal creepiness show in September. Does that think I did two shows in September? Uh, yeah, I must have done. I remember there being some problem where I had to uh, be rescheduled or they even gave me a free night um, to make up for cancelling me after I booked the room. So, uh, yeah. 
So, uh, that is sort of the background to Not As Shy As I Was. I think probably now uh, I'll start reading some pieces. I'll start at the beginning and uh, yes, it seems like a good place to, uh, to begin. this stage, by, by the stage of not as far as I was, um, yeah, I, I, it, it was sort of something I felt I had to do. And I think there's more than one Yeti poem um, in this collection. In fact, there definitely is. But, um, yeah, the first poem in the book is a Yeti poem, and it's called Another Yeti Poem. By this stage, I think I was aware that uh, there were lots of Yeti poems, and I'm poking fun at myself really it's another yeti poem it's a bit like all the rest it's more about those blooming yeti still gotta get stuff off my chest i gotta dig up any facts that still are yet to be displayed things to make you really laugh things to make you quite afraid songs of pudding songs of pie if you heard a yeti sing i think the chances are you'd cry still i don't want to upset you with tales of tragic yeti woe it's just that i'm a yeti expert so come on what do you want to know? It's another Yeti poem. Just how many can there be? Just how many could I write? A good deal more than two or three. I find the Yeti's daily life so fascinating, it's amazing. They're oh so intelligent. We seem as thick as double glazing. And those Yeti can't half dance upon the table, cross the floor. That sort of tippy-tappy talent, it just ain't something you ignore. It's really something you must witness, and you may join in if you will until you feel a little knackered whilst those fine yeti top the bill. It's just another yeti poem. I want to make it really raw. It's got to keep you wide awake. No, I don't want to hear you snore. I've got some myths about the yeti that I hope you've never heard. Some of them involve inventions, so listen close, trust every word. I don't suppose you knew the yeti had a quite clairvoyant mind and the most booming baritone that I think you're ever going to find. Well, the achievements of the Yeti, it would make a massive list. I could write out every one and there would still be some I've missed. It's just another Yeti poem. I really hope this one's the best. I've added in some extra smut and just a little flash of breast. I'm mixing in some extra growling. I'm stirring in a current bun. I want this ditty to be scary, but at the same time to be fun. For there's no point in Yeti poems if you do not enjoy the journey if they're not really rather weird, and yes, a little twisty-turny. But now, alas, it's time to stop before the furry rhyme gets worse. But still, I think I can predict there soon will be another Yeti verse. Next up, uh, we have some Auntie Astrid stories. Um, well, they're like letters. The ones I think I must have written because it was only the early ones that I wrote with my friend Gareth. And these ones are set in, in Germany. Um... I think I'll, I'll read. Um, I'll read at least the first one. Let's see how this goes. Dear Auntie Astrid, I have an odd confession, an issue of manners, and where I come from, manners are a big deal. One would rather suffer oneself than cause anyone else embarrassment. My tale is this: whilst on holiday in Germany last summer, I visited a modern art gallery in Düsseldorf, where I was unfortunately mistaken for one of the exhibits. To be honest, I have been afforded a central location, and obviously I don't really like to give up such a key spot. It's pretty flattering to have people stop and point at you, gasping in wonder at my... Well, I'm not sure what they gasp at, but they do. On the other hand, I've not seen either my family or my boss since last August, and I'm concerned that I might be missed. What should I do? Yours in confusion, Sydney P. Cuttlefish, Esquire. Of course, Auntie Astrid... Um, she replies, Dear Sydney, it is quite clear to me that you are really in a bit of a pickle here. But, I think, what it comes down to in the end is a choice between what you know and the glamorous unknown, between fame and an everyday life, if you like. Thank you so much for including the link to the gallery website, where I am pleased to see that you are included amongst the top ten artefacts 
which bring a wow factor to the exhibition. I particularly like the picture of you wearing the vivid 1970s polka dot lampshade. I also really congratulate you on your ability to juggle that many haddock whilst blindfold. Although, shouldn't it be you blindfolded rather than them? You might be expecting me to encourage you to return to your old life and responsibilities, and although it is not up to me to make such life-changing decisions one way or another, I think you can guess as to which decision I might make. Good luck, Sydney, and keep in touch. Love, Astrid. P.S. Any chance of free tickets to the gallery? Cheeky, I know. Sorry. I did enjoy writing the Auntie Astrid letters. Auntie Astrid appeared in some of the Mouse of Commons books. Um... The next one's called Autumn's Coming. Um, I, I remember when I was looking at, was it the Autumnal EP? I think it was. Um, because this book got so delayed, I even included some of these poems um, as extra material in, in the Autumnal EP as a sort of uh, taster of what was to come. Autumn's Coming is, I don't know if this is a hundred word story, it's pretty short. Autumn's Coming. It was while sitting in Hyde Park one sunny late September afternoon that she witnessed the unexpected arrival of autumn. At first the change was gradual, but then suddenly it began to accelerate, green leaves turning gold and withering before her eyes. Autumn approached resolutely across the serpentine, sending the geese flying in fear, turning clear water grey. Autumn was coming. For her. She rose in panic as it surrounded and stalked her. Please no, she begged as it considered her plea. Then, suddenly, as quickly as it had arrived, autumn was gone, stealing six months, leaving only a wrinkle. This is the ballad of Dead-Eyed Bob. Oh, Dead-Eyed Bob, Dead-Eyed Bob, he looks a tad unhappy. Perhaps he's lost his false teeth, maybe wears an adult nappy. It is hard to be quite certain, whatever is it that's the matter. Is he on some seafood diet? It only seems to make him fatter. Dead-eyed Bob, dead-eyed Bob, have you got a proper job? Your mad-eyed stare is so demented, a loony bin you once frequented. Oh, dead-eyed Bob, dead-eyed Bob, he really looks a trifle grumpy. He has got such hairy ears and one ex-wife who's rather frumpy. Well, he tries his best to look sincere, but his gaze is oh so glassy. You may think that he can fool us, but he will never be that classy. Dead-eyed Bob, Dead-eyed Bob, you've really got a massive gob. Your opinions you don't have to share. No need to speak, just sit and glare. Oh, dead-eyed Bob, dead-eyed Bob, whatever can be wrong. He is not the sort to stand aloft and break out into song. The birds in the horse chestnut trees roll their eyes as he goes by them. Because Bob's so very dreary, no, you will never occupy him. Dead-eyed Bob, dead-eyed Bob could win the pools yet still he'd sob he's the sort of guy that folk like teasing with bob there is no easy pleasing poor dead-eyed bob now i've written a series of scripts a script series which ran to three seasons three or four seasons I, I, i forget now um it was called the beast of friends it started out as a a one-off play or well i had intended to write more but um it 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 took me a while to go from the first episode um to write the whole series and then write multiple series um i wrote the first episode and then uh stopped and then a year or so later um the show being human uh came on tv and although i had no intention of sending the beats of friends to any tv production companies uh, I was a little bit despondent because it, it felt like it was a very similar premise. Not that they knew, but, you know, when you work on a project that then it turns out somebody else is doing, it can be a little bit depressing, perhaps. Um, although, uh, so, so The Beast of Friends was about a load of characters living in a house. Most of them were supernatural of some kind or other. Some of them came from Sutton Park. I think Cromarty was one of them. Um, Cromarty, maybe, and Clive the Clock, who were probably the characters that worked least well in the series. I I believe I wrote them out uh, after a season or two. But um, I wrote a poem, though, called The Beast of Friends. Um, I can't remember quite what order this came in, as far as had I 
completed any of the seasons. I'm sure the fact file will tell me. Let's see if it gives me any clues. Oh, apparently I wrote this poem to go at the back of the Series 1 script book. And the pilot episode script actually appeared in my Funeral for a Shoe uh, collection. Um, but anyway, The Beast of Friends. Oh, the best of friends they were became the beast of friends instead. They always seemed to love a Barney, no, no matter what their mothers said. They were called the beast of friends, were always at each other's throats. You'd hear more irritating bleating than a field of rabid goats. They always claimed to be good pals, but with such fury did assert. Directed squarely at each other, it's a wonder they weren't hurt. With their teeth bared at the ready, with their claws extended thus were just the beastliest of friends. Folk just ignored their random fuss. They were called the Beast of Friends. They always swapped birthday gift, despite them being bitter rivals, despite their angry boyhood rift. Oh, each ruck they had, it seemed, to end without an outright winner, forever shouting over breakfast, scrapping all through tea and dinner. With their anger at the ready, they kept on coming back for more. They were the beastliest of friends, yes, they would bellow, really roar. They were called the Beast of Friends. Folks ducked as fisticuffs were thrown. Had been at war since they were born, although by then were fully grown. By then were oh so out of sorts, and really feeling very cruel. Stood back to back beside a tree, about to stage a deadly duel. With their guns cocked at the ready, with their daggers freely drawn. Those beastly friends at midnight, dead, quite sliced and diced upon the lawn. They were called the Beast of Friends. Their plight continues after death. In the afterlife, keep squabbling, even without the aid of breath. So if you hear some ballyhoo or rusty chains so loudly rattling, then it may be those bestest mates, now ghosts so busy up and battling. Sticks and stones there at the ready, with violent words full of sarcasm. Avoid those beastliest of friends. Avoid their sticky ectoplasm. Oh, the best of friends they were, but now the beast of friends they be. They enjoy a fight, yes, far too much, to ever curtsy or agree. The Beast of Friends poem was really nothing to do with the Beast of Friends series, as far as the story was concerned. There were no rival beasts, well, not, not like those in the poem, in the series. It was really just a silly title, you know, to describe friends living in a house who were all beastly um, to one extent or another. Next one is called Bee Sotted. There once was a bee quite besotted with me, his tiny bee wings all a quiver. He buzzed and he buzzed and he buzzed a bit more, then he flew head first into the river. But that poor little bee did not know how to swim, so I scooped him out using a mitten. I did all that I could to regain him to health, but the poor thing was squashed yet still smitten. So I got really close and I did mouth to mouth till I feared for that tiny bee's fate. With my bicycle pump, did my best to revive. And that tiny wee bee did inflate. There once was a bee quite besotted by me. First he stalked me, oh what bad behaviour. But he got into strife and I saved the poor mite. Now to that bee I'm a blessed lifesaver. He can't thank me enough all day buzzes about. Yes, he cleans in the lounge in the kitchen. Does my shopping each week and he dance on my socks. Who'd have guessed bees were so good at stitching? But I'm a little concerned when I save the poor life that I may slightly have overinflated because he is less of a bee now and more a balloon. Best not fret, eh? It just gets complicated. And uh, I had a little illustration drawn for that poem of a bee-shaped balloon. Well, I, I mean, a bee that looks like a balloon. Um, he's rather cute. <laughs> this one's called British Summertime is Here. British Summertime is here, the wind is in the trees, there's mist upon the ocean and there's raindrops in the breeze. The ducks have their umbrellas out, the swans are swanning off, or the scarecrows have pneumonia, or at least a nagging cough. There's a chance of sleet this evening, so you'll need to wear a coat. There's a flood forecast for Friday, so I'd buy yourself a boat. Summertime's hard to predict what weather may arise. Any chance of warmth? Unlikely. But could we cope with that surprise? British summertime is here, the grass is frozen solid. The birds are skating on the ice, but they're looking slightly squalid. 
or the garden gnomes are striking, they'll emigrate to cosy climes, or the goldfish look so glum they're harking back to finer times. Today is when summer holidays guaranteed a little fun, and lotion was applied to give protection from the sun. Now summer time's hard to predict what weather be occurring. If the clouds begin to swell, then a tsunami may be stirring. British summertime is here, but so is hail and thunder, fish and chips and mushy peas, bus stops to shelter under. The puddles grow, the tourists scream, their sun hats have gone floppy. Down on the farm, knee-deep in mud, even the pigs are getting stroppy. Those on the beach got washed away and floated out to sea. They lost all their belongings, and the girls ate their cream tea. Summertime's just a non-starter. Will the weather find its feet? You're going to have to wait till winter to earn yourselves a little heat. British summertime is here. There's a blizzard round the corner. We're not too keen about it, nor's the flora in the fauna. We just like a little sunshine, just to have a little bask. Just to get ourselves a tan, I mean, is it much too much to ask? For the rain to just stop falling, for the fog to just dissolve? Why can't the weather get it right for once? Why can't the seasons just evolve? Summertime's quite hard to gauge, just get out there, don't delay. You're either hot or freezing cold. Have a happy holiday. This one's called Come for Tea. Come for tea, he said, or if you'd rather, have coffee. I was considering buns or a slice of banoffee, but when he asked me for tea, it wasn't tea intended. God, I'm oh so naive. It's not as if he pretended, but once he got me inside, it was all, get thee undressed. It was, whip off your trousers. It was, let's not be so repressed. Soon my shirt and my vest lay in piles on the floor. At that point, I still hoped for tea, although he offered far more. But there was no sign of drink, and I was dying of thirst. I was getting quite mad, and I may even have cursed. Come for tea, he said, or if you'd rather have beer. I was considering cake without guilt, without fear, but when he invited me round, tea he wasn't preparing. He was sat in the lounge, and no clothes was he wearing. Then, as mean as a bull, you could say that he bellowed, Get your kit off now, please. I was hoping he'd mellowed when he smiled, but he hadn't. Making out, he was tough, and I'd still not got me tea, shivering cold in the buff. Still no sign of refreshment, and I was tired of waiting. I'd come over for tea, was now in danger of fainting. Come for tea, he said, or if you'd rather have whiskey. But there was no love in his voice, and he moved rather briskly intent to embrace me and to ruin my day. I want my tea now, I'm going away, I declared. I need tea. It's a real big no-brainer. So I showed him the kettle and I lent him a strainer. If you want to seduce but invite me for tea, then I expect what you offered, because I'm not easy for free. But there was no sign of food from my horrible host, so I found me some bread and I made acres of toast. Come for tea, he said, or if you'd rather take water. The only cake that he owned cost no more than a quarter. There I sat in his lounge, trying hard not to weep, thinking, where are the scones? Sipping tea with this creep. So I put on my clothes. He protested. I shrugged. If I were you, I'd stay put, because your drink I have drugged. If you invite me to dine but are expecting a session, then buy a good brand of leaf. Let this teach you a lesson. While my host remained mute, the dead don't disagree. So I ate the rest of the cake, then went home for more tea. <laughs> That's a bit of a, a forerunner to, a, to the song I wrote with Harry uh, last year, uh, Best Bet. Well, at least the ending is. Um, I'd forgotten that one. <laughs> I didn't like that one. Yeah, I mean, if someone invites you for tea, you expect tea. You might get more, but you definitely expect what you've been invited for. At least I would. Blimey. This one's a little story. It's called Coming Unraveled. It must have taken me almost six weeks to become completely unraveled, but now I'm gone, all gone but for my two eyes, lying loose like old buttons. I first noticed it the day of the picnic, after which we spent the majority of the afternoon on a long country walk picking blackberries. Those brambles must have been the culprits, the foul instigators of my initial damage. Next morning, as I was showering, I glanced down as I washed and noticed a a loose snag of thread that appeared to have broken at some stage. I must have stared at it for several minutes before gingerly taking it between my thumb and forefinger. I pulled, only gently, but there's no denying that I gave that thread a little tug. In retrospect, I'm not sure what I expected next. 
But what did happen was that more thread unravelled. I was horrified. It had never occurred to me that this might be the consequence of my earlier actions. I was so surprised that I finally pushed the errant bobble of wool back on itself rather than attempting to repair it immediately. That was just the beginning, though. All week I was coming across further threads and soon a hole formed. It was like some kind of compulsion. For every broken thread that I uncovered, I simply couldn't leave it alone. Each time I would find myself gently pulling at it, unravelling more of myself on each occasion. Six weeks. Six weeks was all it took, and now here I lie, two lonely eyes and a loose pile of what had once been long strands of my own body. I guess I should count myself fortunate. For most people, this would have been the end. But I have been given another chance. My mother will be here soon and has promised to knit my old eyes a new body, and I shall enjoy watching my development as she does so. What do you want to look like? she asked when last I saw her, and it was only then that I realised the reality, that I was now presented with a choice. I thought a while and then I replied, Make me the same, yet different. And so my own dear mother has promised me that she would do just that. Only time will tell what she will make of me. Second time lucky? Ooh. <laughs> One of these stories, which I won't read because it's long, is called Cracking the Crackless Egg. Um, it's part of a series I wrote in 1990 about a character called Roland Quaverell. It's one of the early stories. It's, it's about um, a giant chicken. I think it's probably the second story in the series. I think I put the first of the stories in one of my earlier books. This is, I think this is probably a hundred word story. Uh, I wasn't writing many of those by, by this point. Um, but now and again, one would come to me. This one's called Difficult Second Album. Gilbert Witness was a music critic, a rather vindictive one at that. He loved to mould the career of any artist whom he considered overrated. Sarah Jane was one such chanteuse. Her first attempt had sold millions. He despised it and made sure that she knew it too. They sent the new album on CD, he noted. How retro. It would still be shite. Pressing play, Gilbert looked forward to ripping it apart. But what actually happened was that the shrill screeching on track one viciously tore into his own delicate mind. Such a very difficult second album for Gilbert to listen to. This one's called Drunk Elk. Actually, it was based on a newspaper article that I read about, I think it was either a baby elk or a young elk, um, who ate a load of apples that were fermenting and got very drunk. Drunk Elk. Drunk Elk, a little woozy. Drunk Elk, so very boozy. They look confused or rather bleary. Such sozzled elk can get quite teary. Traipsing about quite willy-nilly. Traffic cones on head, so silly. Drunk Elk, so very merry. Drunk Elk, sick behind the telly. They stumble clumsy into trees. They've worn the fur right off their knees. Around the town they stagger gaily. They're packed up off to rehab daily. Drunk elk have lost their bearing. Drunk elk so rudely staring. They think they'll put the world to rights. They've got your missus in their sights. Those elk are really just the worst. They drink fermented apples, then burst. This one's called An Elephant in the Room. I had different illustrators draw pictures for both drunk elk and an elephant in the room. I remember the elephant in the room drawing ending up on a t-shirt. There's an elephant in the room. Who the hell brought that thing here? If I wanted entertainment, I'd have bought a pint of beer. Oh, but with Nelly in the room, I find myself now quite distracted. It's just a little overawed and perhaps a little bit attracted. Now, please don't ever get me wrong. No, I'm not going off me a rocker. I'm not about to lose me marbles, but I admit it's quite a shocker. But with an elephant in the room, it will attract undue attention with its evil eagle eyes from some sad outer space dimension. There's an elephant in the room, I think it looks a little shifty, but I just played it at chess and at checkmating it's nifty, so I don't intend to underestimate its crafty skills of competition, because I'm just no good at sport. I'll never stand in first position. No, I won't be launching any protest, nor sitting crossly in a funk. I won't be telling tales to mother, I won't be swinging from its trunk. No, with an elephant in the room, I'm not predicting any tears. I'm happy polishing its tusks or just admiring its big ears. There's an elephant in the room. I really think it's pretty groovy. I hope it sticks around a while. I'd like to put it in a movie. I'd like to take a photograph. I think it looks a little lost. 
unless I haven't any straw, nor even lightly sautéed compost. I can offer herbal tea with just a little slice of ginger. I know it sounds a little mean. No, I'm not usually a whinger, but with an elephant in the room, our rapport can soon grow strained. It seems it's just too much to ask to find one that's toilet trained. I used to like taking expressions like, oh, the elephant in the room, and thinking, the elephant in the room, what would an elephant be doing in a room? What sort of room? Why is he there? And then just writing a completely nonsense poem, really, which is pretty much what that is, kind of. (laughs) This one's called Evil Ivy. This one has an illustration as well. The illustrator for this one was Pete Katsuunas, and I, I think I like to give my um, illustrators as much freedom um, to draw what they, you know, what they liked. I, I didn't really know what Evil Ivy looked like, so Pete drew what he thought um, Evil Ivy looked like, and she looks a bit like a Victorian woman, but she's got a very, oh, she's very harsh-faced. Um, evil Ivy. Evil Ivy, what a shock. Not someone you'd want to mock. Not someone you'd want to pester. You'd see her temper quickly fester. She's got great insight, got your measure. In your downfall, takes great pleasure. Evil Ivy, quite extreme. She'll make you shriek, she'll make you scream. Evil Ivy, what a scare. With her pipe and bird's nest hair. In her notepad, quickly jotting. Makes you wonder what she's plotting. Makes you worry who she's after. Evil Ivy looking vexed, I think she wants you, I think you're next. Evil Ivy, what a fright, with her teeth as black as night. With her eyes intense and cunning, a frown from her will have you running. She's got an eye on all you do. Her hobbies include cats and voodoo. Evil Ivy, not for hire, she's stoking up your funeral pyre. Evil Ivy, what a blast, I wonder if your nerve will last. Are you really going to risk it? Take the chance, but not the biscuit? I wonder who will be the winner. A man shall have you for her dinner. Evil Ivy likes to rave. Horizontal baby in your grave. Actually, I see now from... I guess I sent Pete the poem. So Evil Ivy in the drawing has sort of got bird's nest hair. Well, you know, like a sort of... Not not an actual bird's nest. Like it's in a bun, but it's all messy. And she's also smoking a pipe. Good job, Pete. Um... Now we have some stories, uh, they're longer ones, so so next up, um, this one is called From Where I Stand. From where I stand you're a fool, sir, from where I stand you're an ass, you're oh so remarkably stupid, yes and oh so remarkably crass, you're without any wit whatsoever, you're quite out of sync, lacking style, you've no qualities worthy of mention, with the grin of some smug crocodile, over oh, where I stand you're evil. You are no good to man nor to beast. If you compare us, my dear, you and I, then I seem like some saint or a priest. Whereas you, you, it seems, are a demon, yes, a fully-fledged devil in black, with your horns sharpened up at the ready and your claws out, exposed for attack. From where I stand, you're a leech, sir. From where I stand, you're a goat. It's a shock that you're really so stupid. It's a shock they allow you to vote. You're without any sense whatsoever, You're a bogus, a sham, such a dolt. You're not someone it's easy to care for. Any eulogies bound to insult. From where I stand, you're offensive. With your all-knowing, two-timing wink. You should know it's not all about you, love. You should know that your feet really stink. But it seems that your friends only tell you all the things that you most want to hear. Any chance that you'll ever turn humble? Not a hope, it won't happen. No fear. From where I stand, you're a runt, sir. From where I stand, you're a cad. When you leave, everybody's applauding. When you leave, we're so terribly glad. For your presence is never required. Your reputation's preceding you quick. You're the sort of sad poser we hate so. Your whole attitude makes us all sick. For where I stand, it's plain simple. Well, you either don't care or you're wired. Are you dressed like you're some kind of student? It's a bad look and quite uninspired. Is so cocky and yet without reason. When you smile, your expression is blank. How I'd quite like to teach you a lesson, or maybe just run you down in my tank. From where I stand, you're a creep, sir. From where I stand, you're a dick. You are oh so remarkably boring. You are oh so remarkably thick. You're a flea-bitten scumbag, a mongrel. 
Yes, and that is my glowing review. It's the nearest to praise you'll be getting. I suspect that you know this is true. From where I stand, you're a weasel, with a moth-eaten manner and all. I can see that you think you're so clever. You've the charm of a six-foot brick wall. I'm here now to come and correct you, to surprise you and laugh when you jump, to explain how the world really sees you. Oh, you're no Cary Grant. Just a chump. That, um... It reminds me of someone. It reminds me of somebody who may have been our Prime Minister not so long ago. Although he wasn't Prime Minister when this was written. I was looking at the uh, fact file to see if I mentioned who it was based on. It doesn't seem I had anyone particular in mind. Well, it says it may remind me of somebody I knew in 2009, which I'm not even sure who that would be, but there we go. This one's called Goth's Day Off. It's her day off. Time to slip the chains of darkness for an afternoon. Sometimes it's nice to see how the other half lives. Still, on a daily basis, she wouldn't have it any other way. She loves her look. Her hair is black as ink, rising above her like smoke. The clothes, the bangles, the murky glamour of goth paraphernalia. Lipstick dark as a funeral, sunset red. Purple mascara creeping from her eyes like shadows. And the music, passionate, mysterious, intoxicating. Susie, forgive me, she whispers, praying that she would never find out. She'll never know, will she? Neither her nor Robert Smith. It's just for one day, she reminds herself. Let this be a role. Let her be no more than an actress for searching for a part. It means nothing. She dresses for summer. The weather requires it. Bright makeup, bright colours, bright green blouse, the colour of cut grass, and an orange polka dot miniskirt with large hooped earrings. She leaves behind the DMs and slips on strappy sandals, carrying a vintage purse. Her iPod is loaded with banana armour, with Blondie and the Nolan sisters. Today she's in the mood for dancing, in the mood for a change, and so out she goes, into the sun, smiling at everything and everyone. People who usually ignore her certainly seem to notice her today. They smile at her stupidly, but she forgives them. Foolishness isn't yet a sin. It's part of learning, part of life. I should probably kill myself now, she muses. Darkness creeping back in. I should probably make love, she thinks. I should probably make love, then kill myself, or vice versa. She sits beneath the tree and eats spaghetti, eating meat for the first time in over ten years. Meat is murder, but not today, not on this day. The best day ever, the worst day ever. A day to die, a day to live. Once a year is quite enough. She sits under the tree, the shady haven of her bedroom calling. Just another five minutes, she tells herself. Maybe ten. Susie will have to wait, but she'll be back, like a missionary returning from a great journey, in two minds over what has been achieved. In time she may decide, may return, may remain. Polka dots may never be the new black, but sometimes they do make a refreshing change. This one's called Hello, Hello, I'm Halloween. Hello, hello, I'm Halloween, here to turn your faces green, here to give you sleepless nights, indigestion, laddered tights, a vision that is sent to test you, a sexy ghost who might molest you, to take a trick or win a treat, attend a phantom meet and greet, a pumpkin, if it's carved in error, can bring bad luck, can bring you terror. Hello, hello, I'm Halloween, the most fearful sight you've ever seen, a masked cadaver with a cleaver, a psychopath, an eager beaver, all out to get you, it's the season, murderous intentions without reason. Beware or you will end up dead. You're downfall, careful where you tread. Your nearest exit you should run for. Look right, look left, or you'll be done for. Hello, hello, I'm Halloween. I'll bring bad dreams, I'll bring umpteen. You won't snooze sound the way you're going. It's more than insults they'll be throwing. Skeletons will flock to meet you. Zombies herding try to eat you. Gargoyles watch your every move. My dear, you've so much left to prove. I'm Halloween, but you're so hasty. You look so juicy, so darn tasty. Hello, hello, I'm Halloween. If I am king, then you be queen. Just once a year I come to visit. What is that sound? Shush now, what is it? Your chattering teeth give you away. So frightened and your pallor's grey. Why not embrace your inner freak? Give out a sigh, let out a shriek. Come run to me and be demeaned. You'll be my love. 
I'll be your fiend. This one's called A Huge Decision. It's a story, a short story. Gordon had been surprised by the rather muted reaction that he'd received on returning from the dead. Actually, that sounds wrong. It wasn't that Gordon had risen from the dead like some B-movie zombie. No, Gordon had never actually been dead in the first place. What he had done was to fake his own death, run away from his responsibilities and left his loved ones to fend for themselves, thinking that he had drowned at sea. He'd been a coward, afraid he'd end up in jail for business fraud. His new life in Brazil had gone marvellously. For the first 10 or 15 years, he started a new life, with a new career, and even a new wife and two children. But then, one day after his new wife had run out on him, taking the kids with her, he had taken to thinking that maybe it was time to go back to his old home, surprise his old family and simply claim that he'd undergone a long period of amnesia, which he'd only recently overcome. And so he had. What Gordon hadn't expected was that either nobody believed it was him or they had moved on so much over the last 20 years that they no longer cared. His kids had grown up and lived overseas. His first wife had remarried and chose to ignore him. Most of his friends were either dead or, worse still, had joined the golf club. Standing on the beach in his old hometown, on the sands where he'd faked his death so many years ago, Gordon knew that he really only had two choices. He could either walk away and start again for a third time or he could walk forward into the sea, but this time he must do it properly, must end it, and put himself out of other people's misery once and for all. Gordon stood looking forwards, looking towards the crashing waves, and then turned back towards the fields, and to the inevitable burden of daily responsibility that would eventually build up over time, should he decide to re-enter society. He closed his eyes and sighed. It was a huge decision that he had to make, Gordon made his choice and then, without further ado, he began walking. This is a poem called I Am Sick, But Do I Want to Be Cured? I am sick, I am ill, I'm not right in the head. I am tainted, I'm odd and my face is bright red. I have the style of an ape and the charm of a yeti. Yes, what's more, I'm impure, my armpits are sweaty. It's not exactly ideal or how I wanted to be, but no doctor can fix it, it's just me being me. But do I want to be cured? Is this what life is planned? Become more like them? But good Lord, they're so bland. I am sick, I am ill, I am dearly departed. I am falling asleep just as soon as I started. My expression is blank and I'm ever so tense. I've got no sense of humour and I've no confidence. It's not exactly the way that I pictured things being. I'm not good company nor some starlet worth seeing. But do I want to be cured of this awful addiction? That it's what makes me me, just my friendly affliction. I'm sick, I'm ill, I'm slightly neurotic. I'm almost inhuman and quite clearly robotic. Well, my heart's been removed and replaced with a boulder, but it's keeping me young, but I'm told I seem colder. It's not exactly surreal, but it's clearly not normal. I'm not uptight or scared, nor relaxed and informal. But do I want to be cured now my mind's gently reeling? Let me rise from the dead and I'll do so with feeling. I am sick, I am ill, I am sadly sedated. Say my wild-eyed expression isn't one that is dated. No, it's a look that I work in stiletto-toed shoes. With my head in the clouds, I have nothing to lose. It's not exactly insane, but it's getting quite close whilst I indulge in deceit and in being morose. But do I want to be cured? Spend too long contemplating as I wallow in darkness somewhere heaven is waiting. This one's called I'm a Jellyfish. I'm a jellyfish, so do you want a cup of tea? You may find some seaweed in it, but I never charge a fee. I really want to wrap around you. No, I don't want to sound too smug, but I'm really good at cuddles, yes, if you need a little hug. I'm not as ugly as you think. I have a fine and noble brow. You will notice that it wobbles. Oh, so you want a photo now? I'm a jellyfish, and very quickly I advance with my tentacles around your waist. Well, would you like to have a dance? I'm a jellyfish. Should you want to pick a fight? Do you want to have a wrestle to decide who's wrong, who's right? Promenading on the pier, I'll be waiting there for you. I will sneak up right behind you and maybe cover you with goo. I don't want to take no prisoners. Just simply jiggle with intent. You want to steer clear of my sting? You want to treat me like a gent? I'm a jellyfish and I just want you in my grasp. I'm going to pull you nice and close. Yes, I'm really going to make you gasp. I'm a jellyfish. 
So you want to have a laugh? I'm here amongst the bubbles of your steamy nighttime bath. So do you want to say hello or are you still a little shy? We could take a trip to heaven, but we do not have to die. I do not mean to cause alarm. Hey, I'm just a little rude. So would you like a game of cards, snap, or maybe poker, nude? I'm a jellyfish and I'm aiming to excite. I'm made of raspberry jelly. So come on, baby, take a bite. The next one's called, I cleaned out my dirty mind, but it's still filthy. Yep. Uh, I've been accused of being fruity. I've been called an utter slut. But I resent insinuations that I'm only made of smut. I've got lots of other business swimming round and round inside. So you better take your words back, not sit smugly full of pride. I cannot help what I'm thinking. You think I haven't got a clue. But I can't help that my poor brain's intent on thoughts so very blue. I've cleaned out my dirty mind, but it's still filthy. But yes, I vacuumed every crevice to be sure. No matter how I strive to be more nun-like, my nasty mind is still as filthy as manure. I've been accused of being frisky, lurid details I will spare, but I resent how I'm portrayed, some cause celeb too old to care, for there's far more to me than nookie, although I struggle now to tell of all my charitable works that don't involve some merry hell. I fear I come across too strong. I fear I shock you and I'm crass. I'd like to give you lovely flowers. They're tattooed right there on my ass. I cleaned out my dirty mind, but it's still filthy. And yet I checked to see was free of flecks of dust. So even though I sit here now, I guess quite politely, underneath the table here I'm full of thrust. I've been accused of being naughty. I have been called a total slag, but I resent such accusations. I find them very much a drag. For there is more to me than scandal, or yes, I'm really quite a gent. I like to get you in the nude in pools of quick-setting cement. I never meant then to appall you. It's just my way of being nice. I like to kiss you really quick and put your nipples in a vice. Oh, I've cleaned out my dirty mind, but it's still filthy. I swept it fiercely till the walls began to shine. But no matter how I've tried to turn a new leaf, there's still no mind about that's filthier than mine. Oh, how naughty. Now, this one was a song. I don't think I can remember the tune, although it was recorded on a video. So anyway, it's called I Lost My Heart to a Cornish Pasty. I should just be reading the lyrics this time. I'll do it in a bad accent, perhaps. Oh, once I had a sweetheart, a girl to call my very own. She was really very large, ten foot tall, yet not full grown. She was beautiful indeed, and oh, so terribly shy. And so I donated her to charity. And I swapped her for a pie. Once I lost my heart to a Cornish pasty. I lost my heart, but with no regret. A pasty is forever giving. Yes, far more economical than a pet. Oh, once I had a sweetheart. Alas, who would be mine? But I found my interest waning, as she might have seen the sign. She suspected me of cheating. Yes, she saw me as a fake. And so I packed my bags that evening, and I wed a Christmas cake. Once I lost my heart to a Cornish pasty. I lost my gal, but with no dismay. A pasty is forever loving. See me hook one up without delay. Oh, once I had a sweetheart, a lovely angel whom I dated. She always saw me as I am, a foolish man, so overrated. She could see that I was weak. Oh, from the very, very start. And for my birthday bought me custard. Yes, and a giant treacle tart. Once I lost my heart to a Cornish pasty, but in the end I made my choice. Oh well, yes, I kept the pasty and the girl, and so we're happy now. Rejoice! This one's called Jack Frost's Chili Diet. It's a little story. Jack Frost frowned. He was rapidly coming to the conclusion that dieting wasn't such a great idea. He was attempting to change his eating habits. His doctor had told him that consuming cold food was freezing him up inside, and yet he loved snow. How could snow be bad for him? Jack Frost stared at the tin there before him. It looked harmless enough, but he was suspicious. Sure, he liked the name. Chilly. It sounded good. Like the sort of thing that he might enjoy. And yet, well, he googled it on the interweb, and apparently chilly, although cold-sounding, was warm. Jack couldn't eat hot food. He was against his religion. 
Jack only liked things like icicles and snowballs and the occasional passing iceberg. Hot things didn't sit well in his stomach. To be fair, he'd never actually tried it, but it scared him. What if he ate this chilly, this cold-sounding thing that was actually hot? What if it hurt him? What if it melted him inside? Jack stared at the tin and then pushed it away. No, he thought, I don't trust chilli. And so just to be safe, he had salad and an ice cube instead. After that one, we have some more stories, but they're all a bit longer, so um, I probably won't read those. (laughs) Uh, But I will read this. The Man-Eater of Surrey Green, which is a title stolen from an episode of The Avengers. Beware the man-eater of Surrey Green unless you're aiming to be late. She'll have you for a midnight snack, a quite delicious dinner date. She may tie you up with creepers, hoist you by your own petard, nibble rudely on your toes, then distribute a get-well card. There are many men still out there who've not yet fallen for her charms, who've not yet kissed her cherry lips, nor been entwined between her arms. She's a man-eater for sure. Just don't expect her to be humble. She has just turned the oven on. You will soon hear her belly bumble. Beware the man-eater of Surrey Green unless you've got a gory kink where you dream of being eaten whilst you're being plied with drink. Because that lady from the green shall happily accommodate you. But there is just no getting back. But there is just no going back once she has sliced and diced and ate you. When she looks you in the eyes, she's gauging, should she grill or bake? She would really like to taste you. What sort of pie is she going to make? She is a man-eater, it's true. Grab a man today's her motto. She'll pop you in her stewing pot, or you might make a good risotto. Beware the man-eater of Surrey Green. She is not someone you'll forget. See her striding round the market with her harpoon gun and net. She's become quite an expert hunter of any male she finds attractive. She's not too choosy nor selective. Just up and at them, really active. She is going to sink her teeth in. You're one of the chosen few, who she has got her beady eye on, who she intends to gently chew. She's a man-eater, no doubt. She is really quite despotic. But who the hell can just ignore her when every glance is so hypnotic? This one's called The Melting Snowman. It's another short story. Katie hated the snowman that sat on the green opposite their home. It petrified her. She might have only been seven, but Katie knew something evil when she saw it, whilst adults many years older seemed oblivious. At the weekend, elderly Mrs Smith had slipped up in front of it and had been taken to hospital. Nobody had mentioned her since, but Katie had seen her mum crying, which wasn't good. Mrs Smith was just the first. There would be others. Katie knew it. Was the snow evil or was something controlling it? Katie had examined a lump yesterday and had decided the answer was no. Something was trapped and frozen within. But now she noted the sun was shining and the snowman had begun to melt. This meant just one thing, one thing that made her truly shiver. Whatever force that lived inside the snowman would soon be free. Uh, what about other books around this time? We had poems about Cthulhu's and um, and, and all sorts. Uh, I thought there was one about a Minotaur um, in in that one, but uh, uh, I, I think well. Anyway, we've got another Minotaur one called Mine Own Minotaur. It, it's well, it's almost a song, but uh, Mine Own Minotaur. Oh, you look slightly wasted. Overdone eating grandmas, grilled and lovingly basted. Every day on your feet, chasing trespassing dummies. Holiday making chavs, yanks, Norwegians and brummies. You just need a quick nap, just a moment to settle. Pop some classical on, not more industrial metal. You need some peace in your life, your blood pressure is rising. Leave it all up to me, a romance I'm devising. Mine own minotaur, mine own minotaur. I want you to sing to me, I want you to roar. You've the voice of an angel, but just a tad out of tune. When we declare our true love, let's both howl at the moon. My own Minotaur, you look quite out of sorts. Did anyone ever tell you you look good in just shorts? Did anyone ever say that, that your biceps are cracking, despite snuffling up tourists and randomly snacking? 
I know you sometimes get cross and go through rather odd phases, but you're so good at chess and at completing tough mazes. You may look rather fierce with the face of a bull, but you have really nice eyes. Oh, you're so going to pull. Mine own, mine at all, mine own, mine at all. Let us dance until dawn in the nude on the shore. You're a cheeky wee thing and so delightfully twisted. Oh, I simply adore you. You cannot be resisted. Mine own, mine at all, your reputation precedes you. Folk will love you to bits. The whole world really needs you. But I got me good luck, for it's me who has won you. Who can nuzzle your ear and climb nobly upon you? Others don't get that chance, and for that I am grateful. To most people you're mean, oh so eternally hateful. But my mind are tore sweet with your leathery hide. You're not a monster to me, I see your cuddly side. Mine own, mine at all, mine own, mine at all. Don't let anyone tell you that you're simply a bore. You've the sort of persona that fills people with dread, whilst you just turn me on. So baby, let's go to bed. This one's called Mr. Mosquito. Mr. Mosquito, quite ferocious. His table manners, most atrocious. He'll do his worst now as you're sleeping, in your ear hole deeply creeping. Busy, buzzing, has his way. He plans to dine but will not pay. Some claim he cares not why attacks. Just keep an eye out, just don't relax. A horrid, hovering, winged beast. You are his brunch, his midnight feast. Mr. Mosquito, quite persistent. Don't think to him you'll be resistant. Repellent sprays just make you wetter. Whilst pills and potions work no better, those creams you use apply too late. Just help attract them and seal your fate. Some claim he cares not who he'll hurt. He'll chew your veins until they spurt, until your head begins to throb. Oh boy, he don't half love his job. Mr. Mosquito, quite a sucker. Your blood is what he likes for supper. Your tasty neck, your juicy flesh, that crimson nectar tastes so fresh. He'll zoom about without you knowing, still all he needs and then be going. Some claim he cares not whom he bites, from the lowest to the highest heights. How strong his thirst, so very vast, I suspect he's saving you till last. Mr. Mosquito, quite mistaken, so drunk on life, he's looking shaken. A risky choice is way to be, it takes its toll and isn't free. With all this guzzling, there's no denying. It's tiring work to be forever flying. Some claim he should have known the dangers, slurping blood from total strangers. But he met his match, the town vampire. Mr. Mosquito is now retired. This one's called National Treasure. She's a national treasure. She is locked in a box, hidden amongst heirlooms and grandfather's socks. She hasn't been seen since the Queen's Jubilee, since the turn of the decade, since 1803. Why'd they hide her away from our excitable sighs, from our sticky-toothed kids and our sly, prying eyes? She's a national treasure. They should put her on show, with her highest high heels, with her hair in a bow. He's a national treasure, stored behind a closed door, left up there on the shelf, left requiring more with a look in his eye that shows how much he missed, all the fame and the grease paint, all those fans that he kissed. Oh, the sound of their screaming used to make him excited. It used to massage his ego, but alas, never knighted. He's a national treasure. They should give him some slack. They should build him a statue or erect a blue plaque. She's a national treasure. She should be celebrated. She should be so adored, not deplored or just hated. Seems they built her right up just to knock her back down. Seen out wearing a dunce cap when she should wear a crown. They should give her respect, because she'd certainly earn it. They won't build her a bridge, for they fear she might burn it. She's a national treasure, but seems that nobody cares. They should put her for sale of her stock market shares. He's a national treasure, his performance is noted. Yes, with politics flirted, shame that nobody voted. Shame that nobody listened or ever saw his Othello. No one watched him in panto, though he did very well. Oh, why does the whole world act so fickle, so fleeting? Love these stars for a bit, then send them back for a beating. They are national treasures, but pretty soon they'll be gone. And then the gods of nostalgia will have finally won. This short story is called A Nice Hot Bath. After a long day at work, all Christine dreamt of was a nice hot bath. She loved treating herself to new potions, 
bath salts and bubbly concoctions. Her latest one was quite strange, however. It was called Tingle, and it made every last part of her prickle. It was an odd experience, and she quickly grew drowsy. Ordinarily, this would have caused her concern, but that day Christine just didn't care. She was too busy slipping down into the water, her whole body tingling, melting. Oh well, she reasoned absent-mindedly, at least whatever is left of me will be clean. I really ought to read this one as it's, as it's the name of this collection. Not as shy as I was. I am not as shy as I was, becoming braver than before. Oh, single-handedly I stand up to all bullies. Yes, it's war. I am armed and I am ready. They will not get away scot-free. I have got my tickling stick out, so stay and fight. I'll never flee. Even zombies do not scare me. They're no more scarier than you. Neither vampires nor werewolves. I guess I've dated one or two. I'm far more confident these days. You know this yet he's not for turning. We're better friends than enemies. I'm getting ancient, but I'm learning. I'm not as shy as I was. I'm used to calling every bluff. I'm not exactly made of steel, but I'm no longer made of fluff. I'm not a pushover no more. I'm not that one you used to know. I'm no more the cowering coward that I was back years ago. Even politicians do not scare me, though they get me quite annoyed. But they don't want to mess with me. I'm a foe best to avoid. I'm more assertive now for sure. I really think I've proved them wrong. As I get older, also wiser. Knew I could do it all along. I'm not as shy as I was. I'm getting bolder by the day. I'm blazing stronger by the month. I like my beard is turning grey. Because it's a little bit distinguished. Next I shall get a walking stick. I must note down my newest poems. So what was that next line? Quick. Oh, I'm a tougher nut to crack now than when first I roamed the earth alongside all kinds of dinosaurs. All this hard work has been a worth. I'm more forgiving now, you see, and I no longer get the hump. Traffic wardens leave me be. Big dogs no longer make me jump. I am not as shy as I was. I have transformed myself at last because that Mika Marder me has left for good back in the past. I like to offer education, but such experience must be earned. There's just so much still left to know, far more than ever can be learned. But then in time you get a life and cast aside all that frustration, a form of madness you can live with, your ideal final destination. You'll grow more fabulous each year, and your insecurities will lift as your weaknesses blossom into strength, and you'll see that shyness was a gift. I'm not sure I am getting more fabulous each year, but there you go. And I do now have a walking stick. So uh, this poem predicted my future. Uh, This is called Patience is the Key. There they sat, alone in the room, yet together, dozens of them, forgotten. Hey, he'll come back for us, said one. Oh, yes, of course. Dave is not the sort to forget a birthday. He'll remember eventually, agreed another. He's been distracted of late. New job, new city. You know what he's like. The room fell silent. They all heard the footsteps. This will be him, they all thought, but no one dared speak it. The footsteps passed by. He'll be back. We just have to be patient, said a voice hopefully. The others agreed. Patience is the key. There in his room on the other side of the world, David revelled in his new life, that new job, new home, new city, new partner too, with a baby on the way. His life was such a whirl these days, he barely ever thought of his old friends and was pretty sure that they felt the same. After all, had it really been such a great time in his life? It seemed pretty insignificant now. Had he really been so close with that crowd? Old school chums, ex-girlfriends, old work colleagues, even his family. Looking back, he wondered what they'd ever actually had in common except for shared circumstances. He wouldn't miss them, and neither would they miss him. There they sat, alone in the room, yet together, dozens of them, forgotten. He'll definitely come back for us, said one. Yes, of course. David's not the sort to let a friend down. He'll call eventually, another agreed. He's been distracted of late. What with the new baby? The room fell silent. They all heard the footsteps, and they listened, and they waited, for they knew... Patience is the key. Uh, This book even has a handwritten recipe for nutty bits that my great aunt Jessie used to make. Uh, They were very good. I found a letter with the recipe uh, inside. 
from her. It was about 10 years after she passed. Well, I thought, why not put a recipe in my book? This one's called Shaving Werewolves. Shaving werewolves for a living is a scream there's no denying. You should ensure that you are armed because it can be death-defying. You will soon see that fur will fly, so concentrate and pay attention. For a werewolf can be wily. We don't want tears, it's worth a mention. Best to follow all the guidelines as you unsheathe your brand new clippers. One mistake, one clip too quick, and you will wish for pipe and slippers. Shave a werewolf up a bob, and he might look oh so dismayed. He won't devour all your kids, just don't be expecting to get paid. Shaving werewolves for a living, it's really quite a thankless task. You cannot keep them in at night, for in the moonlight they must bask. Just as soon as they are smooth, they undergo a transformation. Caked in hair from top to toe, or is that just too much information? You can wax them all you like, often to try can be a hoot. But you can't reverse the call of nature, and most are proud to be her suit. Shave a werewolf a Mohican, and you may get yourself a shock. They don't have much sense of humour, so you'll find it better not to mock. Shaving werewolves for a living is a curious debacle. If you shear them really short, they look so clean they almost sparkle. But very soon the coat's grown back, and they're as hairy ass as ever, until their quite unruly manes are buffeted by blustery weather. You'll really find it quite a howl. Soon happy growls they'll be bequeathing. Just treat them gentle with respect, and they will never sink their teeth in. Shave a werewolf up a beehive, you'll soon learn it's just not right. They will teach you quite a lesson, one which involves their deadly bite. This one's called Something's Up with Rocky Lobster. Now, in the pictures in this book, I'm holding uh, a toy lobster that I was bought by my friend Dan. Uh, it, it made a lovely little wiggle. Uh, I had it for quite a while, but unfortunately it got damaged, and I no longer have it. But it's preserved in the photos for this book on my blog and also in one of my videos but uh, i miss rocky this really came to me because in pictures you often see lobsters um being red now, i think a lobster would only be red if it was cooked so how's it wandering around so, so yes my, my wiggling lobster being bright red and yet wiggling made me think well there must be something a bit odd going on something's up with rocky lobster Something's up with Rocky Lobster, he's as pink as pink could be, which suggests that he's been cooked, but still he walks beneath the sea. There's something odd about that crustacean, I have heard the sailors say. If twas living as is normal, then he would be an ashy grey. Oh, but Rocky stalks the seabed with a zombie swaying gait, out in search of startled seahorses, behind the shells he lays in wait, with the groan of the undead, with his mandibles all swishy, all the crabs know something's wrong, something quite odd and very fishy. Something's up with Rocky Lobster, I really think he's pretty dead. I just do not think he knows it. He isn't blushing, yet he's red, which in a lobster is a bad thing. No, it's just that he's been boiled, that the life's been steamed right out him, that his ambitions have been foiled. And yet Rocky staggers onwards, hunting hungry for his food. He simply wants to eat their brains out, he's quite deceased, yet in a mood. Rocky scavenges for victims. He isn't someone you'd ignore. That zombie lobster's coming for you to snap you right between his claw. Something's up with Rocky Lobster. Don't let him get you in his pincer. Still, he's moving pretty slowly. He's such an underwater mincer. He's such an oceanic terrorist. He's such a menace from the deep. Why won't he pack it in now, really? Even the mermaids cannot sleep. What can we do about Rocky Lobster? He's really set to make his mark. Last week he even came off best in a vicious set to with a shark. There was just one thing to do about Rocky. He thought he was the great I am. Well, they all lured him to a cobble and now he's trapped inside a clam. Poor old Rocky. This is a silly one about cake. I think there's two about cake before the end of this book. But anyway, I'll read this one. The truth about cake. Cake is delicious. Yes, cake is your friend. Cake costs no more than you're able to spend. It's constructed of crumbs, but they're ever so tasty. Eat the whole thing at once. That's a little bit hasty. But we like that you like all our cakey-based treats. It keeps your mind on the game and your kids off the streets. That's the thing about cake. It can be quite seducing. But if you eat fast enough, it can be weight-reducing. 
Cake is cake-tastic. Yes, cake can't be banned. Woe betide any baker who makes cake that is bland. Because cake should be moist, never dried up and flaky. Lack of food makes your belly grow grumbly and achy. Ain't it ever so mean, allowing that to occur. Because life on a diet's nothing more than a blur. That's the thing about cake, it's a great appetizer. And if you eat you enough, you're bound to grow wiser. Cake is terrific, yes, cake is a blast. If you keep it on ice, there's a chance it may last. But it's so good to eat, it's not easy resisting. One should really say no, but you keep on insisting. Give me just one more slice, serve their neat on a plate. Yes, I've already had six, I suppose I should really wait. But that's the thing about cake, it's just so darn alluring. It's one addiction I'll keep. My infatuation for cake? No, it doesn't need curing. Well, we've got a few more to read, but we are coming towards the end of the episode. I'll read two or three more, and then I'll save two or three for after I've said goodbye. But, uh, yeah, Um, this next one's called A Wake Up Call. Wake up, wake up, try looking merry, knocking back your breakfast sherry, eggs on toast, flambéed in custard, bakewell tart, spread on the mustard, a plate of shrimp, a bowl of muesli, cut backwards quickly to confuse me. To be or not to be at all. Oh heck, this really is a wake-up call. Wake up, wake up, try looking jolly. We're skint again, we're utter folly. You get no joy, you get no thanks. Dressed as a chimp out robbing banks. A long-lost aunt would be of merit. Whose family jewels you might inherit. Your wife's hunky uncle, twelve foot tall. Oh boy, this really is a wake-up call. Wake up, wake up, try looking perky. Plucked and stuffed just like a turkey. All the gossip that you're hearing is all for you, it's quite endearing. Do you think perhaps you lost your way? Go on, deny it, have your say. It is your duty to appall, so shock them. They really need a wake-up call. Wake up, wake up, try looking happy. Stop being mean, stop being snappy. There really is no need to scream, just take the drugs and kill the dream. Grow a backbone, take the joke, snort another line of coke. Make them take notice as you fall. Your one last fatal wake-up call. Now, I'd like to say that poem means something, but really, it's quite a lot of nonsense with maybe something going on in that nonsense. Yeah, there's something in there, but there's also a lot of a lot of nonsense. Just, just in case you wondered. I should probably read this one. Uh, it's called The Wedding Breakfast. I was asked to write this by my friend Glyn Green to be read at his civil partnership. So this is the wedding breakfast for Glyn and David. It is time to duly toast the happy couple. It is time we reach the business of the day. Now our friends have made their love affair official. Three cheers, yet now I've something more to say. I've known this pair of grooms for quite some time now. They're looking very smart, you will agree. With their beards all spruced up nice for the occasion... They will pose for photos soon, but for a fee. A little later, you will see them on the dance floor. Well, rumour has it they've got rhythm by the yard. They will pull some disco shapes, such groovy movers. Get out their way if they are waltzing extra hard. You're very welcome, if you wish, to come and join them. If you want to come and have a little whirl, come and dance whichever way you feel best suited. An energetic dozy doe or simply twirl. On this very special day, they're celebrating... If I may, I'd like to offer up a toast of all the friends I have whose names are Glyn and David. These two, they are the ones I like the very most. Ah, true love is something always to be treasured. There are so many choices now for them to make. My choices, though, involve the wedding breakfast, and my thoughts drift quickly to the actual cake. I'm wondering if the grooms on top are bearded. I'm wondering if the cake's shaped like a bear. I'm wondering if there's any chance of seconds. Sneak some home beneath my hat now. Would I dare? I am informed that they will honeymoon in Venice. A very nice, I say, a quite fantastic place. With all the sights and sounds and quite delicious ice cream, is there some chance that they might squeeze me in their case? If I am very nice to them, perhaps they'll let me. If I promise to be good and quite polite, if they have themselves some pasta or lasagna, I'll behave myself for just a little bite. Still, I must curtail these dreams of foreign travel. And sign off on happy thoughts, a special day, to our two stupendous grooms now here before us. Let us wish them all the best. Hip, hip, hooray. 
if I had to read that to the whole of the, the wedding crowd, uh, the only other time I'd done that, I wrote my best man speech um, for Nick, well, uh, Nick and Ali's wedding um, in poetry. I can't remember whether I, I said stuff and then read the poem or whether that was it. Um, I felt like that was probably it. Must be one of the shortest um, best man speeches ever. I guess the audience were quite pleased by that. I was quite nervous. This one's called We're All Just Brains. We're all just brains inside a human-shaped receptacle. We whiz about until we've had enough. We enjoy fine wines and being quite respectable and often picture those we fancy in the buff. We spend our money on new clothes without confessing. We'll pretend we never spent a cent today. There are so many problems we should be addressing, but our poor brains prefer to take a holiday. We're all just brains inside a body made for doing things, although we're lazy and we much prefer to sleep. It's our nature far more often just to ruin things. We sow our seed yet act surprised when asked to reap. We're good at pampering ourselves and being greedy. We learn new facts but often just get bored. With our puppy-eyed expressions act so needy. Our poor brains get very cross if they're ignored. We're all just brains inside a head that's grumbling. We should see the good side more, cheer up a bit. We should speak up for ourselves instead we're mumbling. Instead of standing up to fight we simply quit. We do our hair, get tattoos, do our fingernails. We try to look our best in case we pull. We all act like we're the first, like true originals. Our brain will say what's on its mind, yet just talks bull. We're all just brains inside a body that is failing us. But we fail our crumbling bodies back in turn. We do not heed the warning voices that are hailing us. We go on torturing ourselves, but never learn. Our bodies sit and wonder what is going on. As our legs drop off, as organs fail to heal. Our stupid brains act cowardly instead of being strong. Then as we die, all they can do is sit and squeal. That's sad. It's kind of true, but sad. I often feel like that. I often feel like um, when we're talking to people, it's just like it's our brains talking to other brains. <laughs> this one's called The World's Best Worstest Dancer. He's the world's best worstest dancer. It's a position that he treasures. Dancing awkward in a corner is one of life's inexpensive pleasures. Dancing to his heart's content is his idea of quite a treat. Just spinning there unaided with his two left dancing feet. He's not a master on the floor, but he really tries his very best. His blatant lack of dancing prowess could well lead to his arrest. But he's endearing because he's trying. The fact he's bad, it matters not. People love to back a trier, and I believe some find him hot. No, he doesn't have the skills, and he doesn't have the answer, but he will not give it up, for he's the world's best, worstest dancer. He's the world's best, worstest dancer. Some may claim it's quite a shame, but he's the only one at fault. There's no one else that he can blame. Watch him twirl upon the stage. He's really got a lot of gall, for he is spinning faster, faster. I'm pretty sure he's, he's going to fall. I'm pretty sure he's going to crash. I'm not too sure we'll all survive. He'll cause a pile-up in the crowd. Is that a rumba or a jive? He's going to break the chandeliers, robot dancing now in error. Just see his dubious dozy doe. Oh, what a body-popping terror. He's such a voguing liability. He's such a lunatic, a chancer. He'll have somebody's eye out next, for he's the world's best, worstest dancer. He's the world's best, worstest dancer. See his legs, they're like spaghetti. He really needs a proper teacher, please. Someone call the Disco Yeti. He cannot even do the tango. No, he can barely even skip. If he tries to do the foxtrot, he'll take a step, but then he'll trip. There's a danger he will hurt himself. His coordination's really poor. He is like an errant dodgem car as he careers across the floor. Yes, his moves lack symmetry, but in a way it is a blessing. For a dance floor's just for dancing. It's, it's not some canvas for confessing. He's entertaining, that's the point. Of such a sweet, sure-footed prancer. Let's hope he never gives it up. Our very own best, worstest dancer. Right, I'm going to read one more poem. And then I'm going to say goodbye. And then I'm probably going to read uh, two prose pieces and two poems after, after I've said goodbye. So, um... Let me read A Yeti in a Hat as my last poem before I go, or go the first time. <laughs> uh, a Yeti in a Hat. A Yeti in a Hat is a familiar sight round here. 
It's a sight some fine bazaar. It's a sight that some hold dear. Whether trilby, cap or fez, whether bowler, stove or hood, a hat keeps yeti ears warm in a way that they find good. For yeti may be furry, even something rather bold. But in the end, they're just like us, and they can still catch flu or cold. They can catch all kind of chill from any freezy, frozen draught. So when they're out, they need a coat, a hat, some gloves, and yes, a scarf. A yeti in a hat is quite a dapper sight to see, for a head is quite a useful place to store a pot of tea. Yes, a hat has many uses, can reveal a wealth of joy, but can conceal a lot of secrets with the power to destroy. It can house a deadly missile, it can make you so afraid, well, a hat can hide a bomb or a tick-ticking grenade. But on a brighter, lighter note, now you are all quite wide awake, well, a hat can hide a kitten or else some scrumptious slice of cake. A yeti in a hat is a sight that tourists seek. Many like to look beneath it, and they'll give the brim a tweak. There are some become enlightened by the visions they behold. There are others simply faint, but what they see cannot be told, because yet he keeps all manner of strange things upon his head. Some are pleasant, some may bite, some grown a bit like the undead. It's really best to ask the wearer if it's safe to take a squint. Please leave well alone and take the hint. A yeti in a hat is now far rarer than you'd think. In fact, when most folks see one, yes, they will put it down to drink. You see, it's e-regulations that, of course, is sudden ban. I'm still nostalgic for those times. Yes, I was really quite a fan. For in a sequin balaclava or on their speedy rollerblades, you could not beat the sign of Yeti in a hat and swanky shades. Oh, such sophisticated beasts. Don't you agree with my response? To keep cream tea within paws reach is genius. Park there upon one's furry bonts. Well, there we go, listeners. That is, well, almost. Um, that is not as shy as I was. Uh, the book that I released around the time I was 40. Uh, sadly, there won't be a, a book coming out around the time I'm 50. But there'll be plenty of podcasts. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I am thinking about writing new poems. I have done the odd lyric. Um, but... Uh, Yes, it's been nice to revisit this collection. A lot of these poems I performed either at the Poetry Cafe or on my videos, which of course are still available on YouTube under under Mr. Shy Yeti. That's M-R, Shy Yeti, all one word. Um, Anyway, uh, the next time I do a poetry episode will be next year now, and I'll be going back to some books that I released in 2004 because I didn't have a new collection in 2014. But... uh, Anyway, right. So, I hope you enjoyed these, and I'll say goodbye for now. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon. You take care. All right. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. pieces two more poems but i'll start with uh, i'll start with a poem called the world is full of bullies the world is full of bullies and they tell you where to go please don't expect diplomacy because they just don't want to know they do not hear you when you talk they won't buy any news you sell it's all about their point of view they're in control and make life hell you shouldn't let them rule your life you make it clear they mustn't try so when they blab let out a yawn you can achieve much with a sigh just give a tut or roll your eyes when every time they try to speak their opinions just their own their egos need a little tweak because the world is full of bullies they love to tell you what to say if they're getting on your wick just punch them out without delay the world is full of bullies and they will tell you what to do they seem to think they know what's best you've got to learn that this ain't true You've got to see their spouting bullshit, that they've no right to make you budge. You've got to learn to laugh them off. Yes, just dismiss them if they judge. They seem to get a special thrill. They really love to get you cross. They are quite infuriating. They've got to know they're not the boss. 
you need to put them in their place and feed them back their own advice. Because you must really turn the tables, fight right back, this will suffice. Because the world is full of bullies, they love to tell you how to think. They've got to take the upper hand, just put some poison in their drink. The world is full of bullies and they tell you what to wear, unless they do not like your hot pants, although they're having quite a stare. Now they do not like your high heels and those sideburns need a trim. They have decided you're too fat and must get down the local gym. Makes them mad to see you smile, you're going to get it in the neck. They much prefer to see you grin, this is a proper nervous wreck. They have no right to make you blue, you've got to make sure they retreat. So grab your nearest red hot poker and chase them straight onto the street. Because the world is full of bullies, they'll have to tell you who to be. Release the dogs to make them learn, it's best to never mess with me. I should probably be taken um, with a pinch of salt. Don't, don't, don't go telling people that I told you to poison people. Or punch them out, either. But, uh, anyway. Uh, this one is called Zombie Flicks are the new rom-com. This is, this is a bit silly. I've got some great ideas for new zombie movies. I'm going to make them all on a budget of two Mars bars and a bucket of tea. We start filming Monday... We finish filming Monday evening. Listen up, folks. You're going to like these. Number one, Taxi Ranker, The Living Dead, in which zombies eat the brains of London residents to get the knowledge so that they can become successful cab drivers. Number two, Picnic of the Living Dead, in which the undead hordes bring a a friend along for a picnic with hilarious and intestine-munching consequences. Number three, Synagogue of the Living Dead, in which a group of zombies feel bad about brain-eating and turn to religion. Number four, Lambada of the Living Dead, in which six undead former dancers compete to see who's best at lambadering, features gratuitous scenes of toe-sucking leading to accidental toe digestion. Number five, Summer Vacation of the Living Dead, in which a family of zombies visit various European cities, eating their way around the Mediterranean, also with hilarious consequences and food poisoning. Number six, Tax Inspector of the Living Dead. Tagline, they may be dead, but there are still taxes to be paid. Number seven, Bongo Drums of the Living Dead. Sequel to Lambada of the Living Dead, but featuring more bongos and increased rump shaking. Also palm trees and perhaps the odd poisonous spider. Number eight, Crash Diet of the Living Dead. Four zombies with cholesterol problems attempt to kick their four brains a day habit and turn to lettuce with quite literally mind-numbing consequences. Number nine, Desert Island Scuba Diving Super Duper Fun Party Elf Santa Claus Paradise Adventure of the Living Dead. I'm hoping for funding from Disney for that one. It should be good. Oh, and finally, number ten, P45 of the Living Dead. Tagline, times are hard when you're dead, but there are always ways to make money. I'm sorry, I think that's actually the tagline for... No good two-timing floozy of the living dead. These titles are kind of interchangeable, aren't they? Oh well, never mind, eh? Anyway, I'll be casting all those in the next couple of days, so give me a call. It's a, it's a no-brainer, right? Personally, I think you'd have to be dead to want to be involved. Actually, if you are, then we'd like you to give us a call even more. I mean, it would keep the budget down for a start. It's been good, but yeah, definitely time to come home now. Wow. Real. No kidding. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. goodbye. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride 48 Dot com. Oh dear, <laughs> what's going on now? Oh, it's the Shy Life Podcast. Let's go. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Univospods.net. That is so cringe, oh my god. You're a man of culture as well. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!
This is called a young head on old shoulders. I used to have an old head on young shoulders. I used to love hanging out with pensioners, with my great aunt Jessie and the ladies from her church, all in the late 70s. I was the only 13-year-old Beatles fan that I knew back in 1987. There must have been others, but alas, I never met them. It was all New Romantics, Live Aid and Acid House when I was at school. This was back when ABBA had just split and was still unbearably uncool. Popular only with the mothers of my school friends. Don't worry, they would say. We like them. It was nice of them to try and make me feel okay about it, I guess. But that didn't stop the girls in our village finding it completely hysterical. I never seriously thought about not listening to them, though. Although I eventually discovered Blondie, Bucks Fizz and the Pet Shop Boys, eventually emerging into the late 1980s fully formed, or as close as I'd ever be. Back then I spent more time rebelling against my peers than my parents. I didn't want designer jeans or trainers, partly because I didn't know why a designer label should make me want to, to own them anyway, partly because I didn't understand why you'd want something that everybody else had, and partly because I knew there was no way on earth that mum and dad would buy them for me. That said, I don't ever remember desiring these things. When kids from my class were trying to get into pubs under age, I was still climbing trees, pretending to be Doctor Who or some other cult TV hero. Muddy-faced and wet-footed from my adventures over frozen dew ponds. I'd rather read or write than go to nightclubs. Making strange home movies probably only of interest to me was what I liked doing. I didn't care. I was a film star. My friends the best supporting actors. I was doing my own thing, not part of somebody else's group. My friends and I inhabited our own gangs and there was no need for a top dog. An old head, a slightly weird and wacky head on young shoulders. I was shy, at least I felt shy at the time, but looking back now, despite schoolboy crushes on other schoolboys, I never questioned being gay. I was never ashamed. Ashamed maybe of how other people might react. Maybe I never gave them a chance to react either way. I just knew that I didn't want to hate them should they take the news badly. Thinking back, I'm really not sure where that confidence, that arrogance came from. It's strange to recall it now and realise how you cope with such things. Mostly you did seem to cope, and often pretty well too. There's no doubt that things have shifted slightly over the years. Somewhere during the early 90s, I caught up with pop culture. I met other people, went to gigs, had boyfriends, heartbreaks, learnt life's lessons, picked through the rubble and worked out what worked for me. And I realised that you could still have an old head whilst taking in new things too. Information is cool. I learnt that at library school. A librarian's life is all about preserving knowledge. And to me, that is pretty cool. I believe my own publicity and nobody else's negative opinions matter. Well, you have to think that way. You find yourself curtsying to the mob, don't you? As time passes, I see how life has changed me over the years. I no longer feel quite as I did back in 1987, nor as I did back in 1992. I think I may be becoming a different kind of person. I may have reached a third stage. In a way, I like the idea of becoming that grumpy old man that you hear so much about, although that could become as boring for me as it will for everyone who knows me. In many ways, I think I'm still searching, still interested. I know a few people not much older than me who haven't bought a chart single since 1989. That blows my mind far more than the idea that bankers and politicians are corrupt. In a way, I'm clinging to the past whilst looking ahead to the future, checking out the top 40 every week just because I've been doing so for so long. Maybe it's a habit, but pop culture has become the cliff edge that I want to keep clinging to. It's probably not that I've changed that much really, well, not in the last 20 years, more that I've found a place that I feel at home in and I'd rather like to stay there. Not ever truly growing up, that's a big part of what puts me where I am today. I'll still climb trees, still get muddy and wet-footed given the chance. I'm still that homegrown film star I chose to be at 18, and to hell with whether anyone watches them online or not. With a bit of luck, I'll always be that way. A shy yeti with a big grin, eyes to the stars, feet attempting a jig on a cliff top in Kent. No more an old head on young shoulders, but now actually quite the reverse. This is another poem about cake. Your cake addled mind. You refuse to acknowledge, you refuse to accept that you didn't imagine me just because you've not slept. I'm the cake of your dreams and your nightmares to boot. I'm covered in icing and filled full of dried fruit. I'm calling your name and you know you must heed. Just avoid my E numbers. Just pretend you can't read. Just pretend you're in shock and can only hear drums. Oh, your cake-addled mind filled to bursting with crumbs. You refuse to acknowledge, you refuse to confirm that we've got quite a history, that it's pretty long-term. 
since you were just a cub you've been tarty for tart you've been spongy for sponge and it's become quite an art i've been calling your name don't pretend you can't hear as you devour each cupcake cast aside every fear feel your confidence grow as your world comes awake oh your cake addled mind simply needs a good shake you refuse to acknowledge you refuse to agree that there's no harm in snacking if you only eat three three large sponge cakes for lunch guaranteed to curb riots stop any wild hunger pangs or suicide due to diets don't deny yourself joy please don't stand around pouting there's no good ever came from you calorie counting if you see a sweet pie don't resist do not fight it obey your cake addled mind yes take a good look then bite it before you complain these these poems are not to be taken seriously please don't eat thousands of cakes and then blame it on me because i write so many silly poems about food and and the like uh, or take photos of nice looking cakes in shop windows um, i have to sometimes post that um these photos were just taken for illustrative purposes and that i didn't eat all those cakes that are in the photo uh, more's the pity but you know you have to be sensible even when you're being silly you have to be sensible it's a shame really but never mind Number seven, Bongo Drums of the Living Dead. Sequel to Lambardo of the Living Dead, but featuring more bongo, but featuring more bongo, but featuring more bongo, no, but featuring more bongo, no, but featuring more bongo, but featuring more bongo, more bongo, but featuring more bongo, more bongo, nose is itching, but featuring more bongos and increased rump shaking, also palm trees and perhaps the odd poisonous spider. Ah, I'm a big fan of his poetry. Et voilà, 